A lot to unpack here today, but let me just preface this piece by saying this is one of the coolest new exciting projects in Rioja. But as with a lot of new projects in places like Rioja and Bordeaux and the Languedoc and stuff, it, it's not really new. It's an old project um, that's like new. <clears throat> so getting on with it, picture this. Napa, it's the 1940s, 1950s. You're one of the cool winemakers in Napa, right? Say you're BV or um, Inglenook or this type of deal. And your winemaker, your winemaker and your vineyard team, they know what the best sites in the Napa Valley are, right? They've done their research over 20, 30 years, 40 years, whatever, and they figured out which grapes grow the best. And accordingly, when you make your BV George Latour and when you make your Inglenook Super Duper Cabernet, you're using the best sites in the Napa Valley, right? It's, it's pretty simple stuff. If you have access to this gear, when you have knowledge that other people don't, then it creates a scenario where you can make kick-ass wine and other people can't as much. This was the case with El Brujo, the sorcerer from the 1950s. Uh, basically, a lot of names today, a lot of Spanish names, so great offense, I might be looking uh, down once or twice. But um, it was, uh, thank you, Ezequiel Garcia. Ezequiel Garcia was the head winemaker at Cune uh, during their formative years, from the 1950s, 40s, 50s, into the 70s. Now, for any of you have been fortunate enough to have a look at these wines, I've been really fortunate to taste a bunch of the Vigne Real Reserva and Grand Reserva wines from this time. These are some of the greatest red wines ever made in Europe. Like seriously, he was the whisperer. He was the one. He was the guy that found the best sites, knew what to do with them, and produced these compelling, absolutely bonkers wines that are some of the greatest wines ever made in Europe. Now, his favorite vineyard is this. Right? That's kind of heavy. That's like saying you know, all those great BVs from whatever, they were made from the best part of Tokelon, right? Which, you know, some of them were, right? And you're going like, okay, now we're just gonna make a wine with this. But here's the deal. Getting back to it, he had already produced a bunch of his compelling Vigne Real wines from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, using primarily the grapes from this very famous vineyard. Now, the grapes were so good that this was the only vineyard that Kune, back in the day, decided to engage in a partnership with, right? Kune, you gotta say these big five or six Rioja houses back then, they were running things. They didn't need to partner with anyone. They just bought your grapes and they friggin' did what they had to do with the fruit. Now, in this case, Kune was like, we cannot let this vineyard go. We cannot let this vineyard from, well, at the time it was uh, Ricardo Perez Perez was his name. Uh, we cannot let this vineyard go. And accordingly, in 1973, the Cune family entered a partnership with Ricardo Perez Perez and, um, and his uh, son, Ricardo Perez Viota, there's a lot of names today, people, um, to create Contino. And for those of you that may recall, Contino has been, you know, the, the great, one of the great shining light projects for Cune, CVNE, and Cotino was the first single estate Rioja wine produced in 1973. Can you believe it? 1973. Before then, Rioja was this, and still is, this um, patchwork of vineyards that sell grapes to the larger concerns who also own their own vineyards, but also buy fruit, et cetera, et cetera. In this case, Cune was like, we're going to make a single vineyard out of this wine. It's so amazing. And they did. And Cotino became one of the great iconic wines in Rioja. This partnership worked brilliantly from 1973 until 2013. So, 40 years? So 40 years of this partnership worked until finally the, um, the family, the Viota family said, the Perez Viota family said, uh, we're done. So Cune was like, oh, sad face, right? But they did a deal. And so basically, uh, Cune kept 62 hectares of vineyard of the 162 hectare property, and the Viota family kept 100 hectares of the property. And if you talk to the Viota family, yeah, they kept the good hectares. They kept the good hectares, and Cune got the okay hectares, uh, as well as the land around the building. Um, so Viota said, we're gonna make wine. So starting in 2018, I think it was the first vintage, the Viota family started producing their own Rioja from the top sites from the historic Contino Vineyard. Whew, boy, that is a lot to take in, I know. Thank you for listening along with me. Long story short, this is the 2021 Viota Rioja. You know, the family 
uh, makes your wine pretty much the, the same way. You know, this is classic Rioja with a modern edge, i.e. there's not a lot of super old barrels in the regimen, but they use mostly neutral barrels, younger neutral barrels, and they pick ripe. They like really rich, yummy, juicy flavors in the Rioja. Look at the color. It has this beautiful, deep, dark color. The wine is 85% Tempranillo, 13% Graciano, and just 2% Garnacha. And the vineyards are gorgeous. It's these vineyards that are terraced heading down to the river, the, what they call the meander of the, uh, of the Ebro River, where it does this, right? And they're like in the, like they're in there. And that is what makes the wine so good, because they're surrounded by the water. They have this beautiful old kind of riverbank soil on top with pebbles, uh, with, a, with a beautiful substrate underneath. This makes really compelling wines. And they have three different terroirs because these terraces they can choose from to produce this wine. Frankly, we're looking at vineyards that are, the youngest vines are 30 years old. And a lot of them were the original plantings. They sell a lot of the original plantings from Ricardo uh, Perez Perez from 1930. So the vine material here is anywhere from 30 to 90 years old, plus years old to work with, which is really, really amazing. The vineyards are absolutely gorgeous. Impeccably farmed by the family. Mm. Just Tempranillo, baby. You know, let's... Tempranillo's a great grape. It's made some of the greatest wines, as I've said previously, produced in Europe, ever. And here we have Tempranillo in all of its beauty. That black-fruited... You want to think it's going to Cabernet, but then Tempranillo gives you a little left turn. That Cassis character goes into a really nice plum thing, and you get more of a plum in the mid-palate, Gorgeous, glossy fruit, wonderful texture here. You can drink the heck out of this now, but. Mm. 21's a great vintage. Supple, generous, long, tannins ultra fine. This is serious dirt. I mean, I have to tell you that this dirt, and I, I just did, this dirt has made some of the greatest wines ever produced in Rioja and still continues to do so. And they make a single parcel wine, which is good. It's very good, actually. Don't get, no, I'm not this. It's really good. But when you taste the regular against a single parcel wine, the, the regular, just the standard bottling of Viota Rioja, it, it just immediately sends you back to that time. This is a time machine wine. It sends you back like, how did some of these wines taste when they were released in 1968? You know, when they were released in, you know, 1972 or 58 or whatever. What were these wines like? And the center of this wine is, is basically the same, right? They didn't do like a complete redo of the vineyard. They didn't completely change how they farm. They, they haven't uh, re completely redone the wheel. This is a situation where you can really, truly get a glimpse of something great. Because this was a single estate wine. You know what I'm saying? So you still got that single estate mojo here. It's here. Mm. I love drinking geography. I love drinking history. I love drinking great versions of geography history. And I love drinking it at a great price. $27. Like, Rioja does it again. You know what I mean? 27 bucks to have that experience. Yes, it has scores, 94 Dunnick, 93 Venice, it's got numbers. But uh, beyond that, it's drinking history. It's drinking a place. It's drinking the meander, right? A hundred years of history almost in this property. And uh, it's cruising along just fine. What a beautiful, beautiful wine from the Presbyota family. Lights out, killer deal. If you don't buy this, I'll be really super angry. Rawr.